sounds good to me. You don't mind if I'm a little bit discursive, if you trigger something that... Uh, Please be discursive. Okay, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Timothy Naftali. I'm director of the Pr Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. I'm here today in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania um, with John Price. I'm very fortunate to uh, have this opportunity to talk to you about your experiences in the Nixon administration for the Richard Nixon Oral History Program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let's, let's start with um, how, uh, how you went from Grinnell to the White House. How did this happen? There are a couple of interesting little historical asterisks on it vis-a-vis -vis Nixon. Uh, I went to grad school and I came back to, from England to law school. Mm -hmm where it happened to be 1962, which was a time when a handful of people in the Boston, Cambridge area were struggling with what they thought the Republican Party should become after the Eisenhower years. And uh, we formed something which was called finally the Ripon Society, which was modeled on the Bow Group, which was a sort of ginger group or think tank group within the British Tory or Conservative Party. And I got recruited for that by a fellow who's gone on to uh, greater glory, and Emil Frankel, and there was a professor at MIT and a bunch of young graduate students who felt that it would be great if we could somehow create a conveyor belt between the world of academia and the Republican Party. So with that general principle in mind, uh, we, we held program meetings guy named John Chafee, who was a freshly minted governor of Rhode Island a long time ago, came and had dinner with us. And uh, Doug Bailey, who worked with Henry Kissinger at the International Studies Institute, was active. And long story short, about a year later, when Kennedy was assassinated, the, the thing really gelled. And we gave ourselves a name, the Ripon Society. And we became deeply interested in particularly the issue of the day within the party, which was the civil rights issue because after the Nixon defeat in 60, uh, the conservatives had stood up and, and very positively and very aggressively said they were going to take over the party and sought to do so. So by the 64 convention, things were fascinating because you'd had Strom Thurmond walk across the aisle in the Senate. A lot of other uh, uh, Dixiecrats had done the same. So the, the party's fault lines were changing and a lot of us youngsters were still on the, on the moderate or liberal side and, and wondering what in the world was the future of the party. Um, uh, Nixon wound up in 64 stumping heavily for Goldwater and was as always sort of a, a, I think a centrist figure within the party. So long story short, I then went to, to uh, actually it won't be too short no, <laughs> if you don't go mind. Go ahead, not, not at all. Um, I went to work leaving law uh, to a Community Development Corporation in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. And uh, it was co-founded by uh, the Bobsey Twins by Democratic Senator Robert Kennedy of New York and Republican Senator Jacob K. Javits. And I was the token Republican that went on the staff there and I cobbled together financing for home ownership in a transitional neighborhood where the traditional you know, Irish, Italians, and Jews were fleeing and the blacks and Hispanics were trying to buy homes. and were being put into homes with uh, a lot of water in the mortgages and unfair practices. So uh, I was into urban development, but I was also into politics. And I wound up uh, working for Nelson Rockefeller as his uh, director of delegate intelligence for the 68th presidential campaign. So I ran the staff that built the dossiers on the 1,333 delegates and alternates for the convention. And uh, uh, we lost, as you may remember. And so I went to lick my wounds, and I had overtures from the Nixon people to come and work with the campaign in the general election. And here's where, here's where I think you'll find, as an historian, you'll find a, a lovely little asterisk. Um, at the time of my being uh, recruited for the Nixon campaign and before at the Rockefeller, I was uh, working for a man named John Doerr, who was running the Bedford-Stuyvesant Development Corporation. The self-same John Doerr, who later was counsel to the House Judiciary Committee, which impeached or was going to impeach Richard Nixon. But go back to 1968, right around now, Labor Day, week after Labor Day, when I was asked to work on the Nixon campaign, uh, 
I had breakfast with John Doerr in Juniors on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. And I said, what do I do? And he said, John, he said, you're a Republican, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, don't be squeamish about it. He said, of course you work for Richard Nixon. He said, the other side is Dave Dubinsky, John Connolly, and Dick Daly. He said, of course you work for Richard Nixon. This is the guy who basically managed the impeachment proceedings later. But so I did go to work for Len Garment on the campaign. And then uh, because of my interest in and some experience in urban affairs and so on, uh, when they were talking about someone to run that, they were seizing on Pat Moynihan. And Len said to me, why don't you go run the traps and sort of do a G2 uh, check on whether Moynihan would work out, whether he'd be loyal, whether he'd be effective, uh, and so on. So I spent a week talking to everybody I could find who either had worked with or knew Pat. Pat was given the job. And then he gave me lunch on my 30th birthday, December 20th, 1968, at the Pierre Hotel. And he said, uh, I don't know any Republicans. He said, I would love it if you would become my counsel. And that's how I got there. A couple of questions. Sorry, that uh, was very no, long. No, it's great. There it is. Uh, one, let's go back to the 68 campaign. Yes. Uh, since you were uh, on Nelson Rockefeller's team. Yes. Uh, handicapped the race for for us. Uh, what, how, how close was the race? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, not at all. Um, Rockefeller was coy, and he had a false start. Um, Agnew, for example, had been an early and ardent supporter of Nelson and Rockefeller's. And then when Rockefeller basically pulled out, even though he never formally announced, but he basically pulled back and said to the party, court me, you know, tell me you love me. And Agnew felt betrayed, and many others did too. And that was one problem with the Rockefeller campaign. There were several others, one beyond that one, that uh, the list of supporters or names he had was, was like an antiquarian bookshop, and all handwritten by George Hinman on cards which were dog-eared and many of whose names had died as I tried to, you know, get to them and so on. So there was, there was a very disconnected tie into the people who really were the powers in the party at that time. In addition, uh, the Rockefeller campaign was structurally totally different from what Nixon had the wisdom to put into place that year. Nixon, with his scar tissue from 60, when he tried to run it all himself, had John Mitchell be basically, I gather, the czar of his campaign. Rockefeller had four or five different sort of parallel tracks up through which you could come, and if you got a rebuff at the top of one silo, you'd go and start up the next one, and it was disorganized and ineffective. Uh, did he have any shot at being chosen for the Veet slot? I don't really know. I think Nixon wanted someone less controversial, and I think he picked Agnew as a non-controversial uh, candidate, even though later on you might say he developed a little bit of skills along those well, lines. At the time, Agnew also had a had an image of being a moderate. Yes, well, he was a, he was a sort of centrist, uh, urban state kind of a governor. That's right. How did a Rockefeller Republican view Richard Nixon? Well, at first, the reason why John Doerr had to talk to me that way was that um, I had a natural feeling that, uh, you know, he was not uh, a moderate, particularly, or a liberal. I had a feeling that he was a tactician, maybe. But this was, I was 30 years old, and I hadn't uh, watched an administration unfold. Um, I think, looking back on it, my summary conclusion of the Nixon years was that he was probably the last of the more or less moderate Republicans. Um, is it true that Moynihan was interested in being Secretary of Labor? Or was he I offered couldn't answer that? that. Because by the time that uh, I was checking on him, uh, I can't remember if Schultz had already been announced. Um, so I can't, I can't give you insight okay. on that. He never disclosed that to me. Um, tell us about what ideas he wanted to bring to government, Moynihan. You te get the job with him, and obviously you start talking a lot. Yeah. Well, he, there were two things about Pat that were uh, relevant on your question. One, he was very interested and was seen as a proponent of welfare reform. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time on that if we could. The second was he was process-oriented. 
And Pat believed passionately that policy should follow analysis. And so this is one thing he had in common with Apollo O'Neill, for example. Both of them are process-oriented and analytic. And I think that for both of them, one of the things they really admired in Nixon was that when he chose to exercise it, he w could be in very, very analytical and very logical. Um, Pat sought and saw the federal government as a, a candy store for him in the sense that there was so much social science research that either was being done, had been done, or could be done, which could be harnessed to making policy, that he was thrilled to be given the opportunity to be a, in a coordinating role. I think, to answer your question earlier about Secretary of Labor, I think he saw the White House as the right place for him because his views clearly were beyond the Bureau of Labor Statistics or workforce demographics or something like that. He, he was interested in policy formulation. Um, did he talk to you about Disraeli? Benjamin? Yes. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I'd read already two or three biographies of Disraeli, including the huge money penny and buckle, late 19th century version, plus the Blake one, uh, which you probably are familiar with. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't in every conversation, <laughs> but uh, yes, he, he did mention it. I mean, but did he really, uh, do you, did, is, the, is the story accurate that he went to President Nixon and said you could be? Be the Disraeli, yes. I'm sure it is from what he had said to me, yes. It, just, it fits with his both sense of history, his being a courtier to some extent, not as good a one as Don Rumsfeld, but Pat was a courtier. And uh, so he would have felt that Nixon would respond to an analogy like that. Uh, why did you make the reference to Rumsfeld? Because uh, I watched Don also in meetings. He was brilliant, you know. and, and uh, certain, you know, flattery, which was not over the top, but got there, and, uh, and spe not speaking when it was appropriate not to speak, and so forth. Interesting guy, smart, tenacious, aggressive guy. Uh, talk to us a bit about the role of Richard Nathan at this early stage. Nathan had been in the Rockefeller orbit also, and uh, wonderful guy. He'd worked for Kenneth Keating upstate in the United States, whom Bob Kennedy defeated for the United States Senate. And uh, uh, Dick was a, is a policy wonk and remains so. And he came down um, as assistant uh, director of, OEM, of BOB, the Bureau of the Budget for Human Resources, I think it was, where Paul O'Neill first fell into his uh, ambit. And uh, Dick was, was uh, broadly interested in social policy. He was very interested in the welfare reform issue, and he and I had major disagreements on it because Dick took a view that we should, uh, in welfare reform, that we should basically simply adopt the national standard for the program then called AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. And uh, we'll talk, as I say, more about welfare, but my view was that the president needed to be presented with other options, too. Moynihan's view on welfare at that point was uh, mired a little bit in a very European attitude about welfare reform because he was for a sort of what was then called a family allowance or a capitation grant where whatever your income level, whether you were Andrew Mellon in this town or, or you know, someone at minimum wage, and if you had six kids, you'd each get a payment for those six kids with the assumption that for the wealthier people, the excess payments would be taxed back. And uh, that didn't seem to me to fly. I'd, I'd been intrigued by negative income tax. And uh, here again, even I and Dick uh, differed. And when I was in the Ripon Society, uh, I became the first paid employee of Ripon as their research director while I was in law school. So I was working 20, 22 hours a week while I was in my second and third year of law school. But we pushed a, a, an idea of the negative income tax. and. A, call, a friend at Yale actually drafted a negative income tax statute in 67, 68. And the clincher was when I was invited in January 68 to a dinner in New York City with Maurice Stans and a guy named Fred Alger and Dan Lufkin and maybe two or three others with Nixon. We talked a little bit about welfare reform. And I said to Nixon that, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm, I'm intrigued by the convergence 
of views on the negative income tax because uh, on the one hand you have Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago saying negative income tax is the right way to go and then you also have Tobin at Yale and Joseph Pechman or whoever he was at the Brookings Institution from the liberal democratic side saying negative income tax. So I, I think it's something that if you get in office you should look at. You said absolutely that welfare reform is, is on the agenda. It's, it's dysfunctional and so I came in with a negative income tax predisposition. Moynihan came in with a family allowance capitation grant predisposition. Uh, Dick was uh, sort of incrementalist uh, mm -hmm. saying well we've got national standards and let's make it work. So that set the stage for the debate around welfare reform. Uh, debate within your, within your group what about outside? Broader, yes. Broader debate. Well, uh, we'll perhaps come back to the, create, the structuring and creation of the Urban Affairs Council, but for this point, there was a committee which was formed, which was chaired by the Secretary of HEW, one of three or four committees of the council at cabinet level. So Bob Finch was the chairman of it, Nixon's friend from uh, California days. And on it also were the Secretary of Agriculture because of food stamp and income kinds of questions. Secretary of Labor, George Schultz. I believe Secretary of Housing, uh, George Romney. And so that group uh, started to look at alternatives to develop an options paper. And, and Dick came in with his AFDC national standards. And then I prepared a, a draft decision paper for him which included that as the less preferred option and a negative income tax as the preferred option based on work of that cabinet level group supported by not just me and Owen and Dick, but by George Schultz's guy, Jerry Rossell, Assistant Secretary of Labor, and by uh, two guys, one from OEO and one from HEW, a guy named Jim Lyday from OEO, and a guy I believe named Bateman from uh, HEW along with Bob Patricelli, and the undersecretary there, Jack Veneman, who was deeply into this, uh, up to his armpits. Um, so it was a broad exercise by that time, yes. But, in, but I'm, what I'm saying is that at the, uh, the get-go, when Nixon was first starting to mm -hmm. think about it, you had these three sort of competing strands that then found their way into the more formal debate. So let's talk a little bit about structure then, Urban Affairs Council. Fine. How does that happen? It, it was very interesting because Nixon always keyed a lot of things, I believe, off his time in Eisenhower's White House. You forget all the resentments or the issues. Uh, I think structurally and in terms of a leadership style, uh, he was interested in what Eisenhower had done. And so what he said to Moynihan, he passed it on to me, was, as we think about urban affairs, I would like to create uh, some sort of an entity which would emulate the National Security Council. And so Pat said, dig, suggest, do this. And uh, Pat then uh, had me go and talk to a host of people, among whom were people who had been on the Eisenhower National Security Council staff. I think, I, even, I believe I even talked to Bobby Gray. This is a long time ago, oh. Boyden's, Boyden's father. And uh, or Gordon Cutler. Gordon, Gordon Cutler. Gordon, Cutler or uh, Gordon Gray. Gordon Gray and, and maybe. And Bob Cutler. That maybe that was, forgive me, yes. <coughs> and. Um, uh, they, you know, obviously there was a style in terms of staff support and so on, which had atrophied under Kennedy and, and Johnson because they just didn't run it in a sort of chief of staff mode the way Eisenhower had. Or go, go ahead, don't. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll stop whenever you'd like water. Eisenhower <coughs> brought, <coughs> I, I think it is said that he brought a, a military approach to, to you know, he, he believed in committees, he believed yep. in staff, he believed in good staffing, he believed yes, exactly. in, in paper trails. Yeah, and I think, I think Nixon basically on policy issues bought into that, you know. As I said to a friend today, uh, he read his brief. You know, he would read the decision papers. Uh, but coming back to, uh, to how we got the thing on the road, it's sort of a fun story because uh, I said, okay, let me look at that, which is a cabinet level statutory entity with shape policy and let's see what else is out there and what I turned up were two things one was over at the poverty program the OEO Office of Economic Opportunity the statute had created something called the Economic Opportunity Council never heard of it 
and it was to be chaired by the director of OEO and all the domestic cabinet secretaries were members, but he was the chairman. And there was also in the HUD Act, the Housing and Urban Development Act back in 65 or whenever it was, 68, something called the convenor power of the Secretary of Housing, where he had statutory authority to convene his cabinet peers to shape urban policy. So uh, anyway, I went to visit with people who'd been involved in both. And what I learned about the Economic Opportunity Council was that Shriver had prevailed, Sergeant Shriver had prevailed on Lyndon Johnson once to come and chair a meeting of it, which he did. And then Shriver tried to hold a second meeting. Johnson wasn't interested. It never was held, nor was any other meeting ever held. I went to HUD, and I talked to folks there, and I said, well, how was this power used? Answer, never utilized, never used. So I wrote a memo through Pat Moynihan. I hope it's somewhere in the archives, though this was before January 20th. And I said, in the closing paragraph of the memo, I said, after citing all this, what it shows is that cabinet members are heliotropic. They like to turn and face the sun. He said, this will be successful only if you chair the Urban Affairs Council meetings. And in fact, before the Urban Affairs Council transmogrified into the domestic council 18 months later, Nixon chaired 21 out of 23 meetings of the council. He did? Yes, absolutely. So he Were was you aware of that? No. I yeah. Don't. You know, so there was a guy who's got a recent book on Nixon and Kissinger out, and I started to read it, and I reached a point in it where he asserted that there was something called the Urban Affairs Council, and it was sub-cabinet level, and Nixon never came. Well, it was cabinet level, Nixon chaired 21 out of 23. I threw the book away. I figured if you're inaccurate there, you probably are about a few other things. So Nixon was uh, up to his ears in discussing Very much. the details mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what would be the Family Assistance Program. Absolutely. And in fact, he asked us to have a Saturday session, which went on for four and a half hours with sandwiches, to just have the cabinet members a noodle on it, which we did. Um, Moynihan wrote him reams of memos, which you've perhaps come across. They're certainly in the library uh, about welfare reform. And uh, uh, I'm a historian, as you are, Tim, and uh, though no longer at all, never a professional. And um, the Burns staff, and I hadn't mentioned how Nixon set up this counterpoint between the Moynihan staff and Arthur Burns staff. Because I think Nixon, always being the trimmer or the leveler, sensed the outrage of the right wing that how would he vest this radical liberal Democrat from Harvard of all places, you know, with formation of domestic policy. So he put with other Harvard people. Well, Kissinger. <laughs> yeah. and, well, yeah. that's right. And uh, so Burns had Ar had Martin Anderson working with him, who was and remains a um, rather ideological conservative type, and. Yeah. So Marty began to zero in on elements of the proposal which he found problematic, either mathematically or philosophically. So this series of memos started, and Marty wrote a memo uh, to Nixon saying, this sounds like the English poor laws, Spinamund, 1834. You know. So Moynihan and I, Moynihan calls an historian, an economic historian in Cambridge, England. I'm on the phone to a buddy of mine who just stepped down from Kenyon College where he'd been provost. And, acting president, English historian. So Richard Nixon was reading pieces of paper over the transom from me and Moynihan and from Marty and Burns on the English poor laws. I mean, this is the God's truth. And he would read them. You know, there'd be notes coming back. And th this is not George W. Bush, you know. <laughs> anyway, this is a man who likes getting his teeth into policy. So tell us more about the how the debate, you know, went back and forth, because we have this yes. interesting eight months before the yes. speech, yes. and that's fascinating and important. Yeah, well, it was, and what, what uh, as I say, I started out with a bit in my teeth because I believed that welfare reform was timely, and uh, as I say, I had a view, but I tried to balance that view. I wasn't just saying, you got to do this. I wrote a decision paper which, which uh, had that in it, and um, here what happened was it became part of a sort of Easter package that Moynihan sat down to Nixon at Key Biscayne. Pat came in scrambling one day saying, we were already hard at work on it. 
but he came in scrambling saying, the president wants a domestic message, you know, he wants domestic policy. So we worked on that. We worked on the, the Washington, D.C., you know, cleanup from the riots, and we started talking about revenue sharing. So Pat went, took down to Key Biscayne a, a folder for Nixon, which included my decision paper on welfare reform and two or three other things. And then what Nixon, I think, frankly, very rightly decided with, I'm sure, Ehrlichman's help, not just for the politics, but again on the substance. Um, Schultz was a part of the group, as I said, and Nixon, sa Nixon said, we have to take account of the working poor. In other words, the, the negative income taxes, it was, as it was outlined, would zero you out if you were s at the poverty line or above it. And Nixon said, no. He said, you know, the fact is that people are working hard, but they're not taking home much. And so you have to find a way to, to continue on through the poverty line to help people at a lesser amount. And so Schultz then got much more into the act. And Ehrlichman, at the same time, also was, I think, saw this as an opportunity to move up the food chain or be more direct. Because if I were Ehrlichman, what I would have done, and he probably did, was to say, go into the president and say, Mr. President, you've got Arthur Burns and you've got Pat Moynihan, and they're advocates. And what you don't need, Mr. President, are advocates. You need someone who can process things for you and so forth. And so it was all caught up, I think, in, in the internal changes within the White House as well as the substance of what was going on. But Schultz emerged, and rightly, as a very strong figure in the debate. Then Marty popped up, Marty Anderson, as I mentioned before, and also Spiro finally focused in on it, the vice president. And uh, to me, while we hammered away and looked at marginal tax rates and so on, and the, the president, uh, after Ehrlichman, as you remember, finally briefed him on the Romania trip, I believe. And, and got his buy-in. Basically, by that time, the president had decided. And so we then all met at Camp David right before the August 8th or 9th uh, speech or paper. And uh, Sapphire was working at it already. And uh, the new federalism speech and, and the welfare reform thing. But fascinatingly, I, I was asked to go and did go to the Camp David meeting where it was an all-hands meeting with uh, Finch and Moynihan and Burns and and Patricelli and me and Nathan, I think, and uh, the vice president. And Spiro Agnew, the sitting vice president, turns to the president as the president was saying, you know, this is, this is the idea. Agnew turns to him, and if there's a transcript, I'd be fascinated. But my ears remember him saying, Mr. President, he said, I'm going up right now. I'm leaving by helicopter from here to go to the Senate to cast what will probably be the tie-breaking vote on the ABM treaty. I'll call you. Before you know, uh, before I go onto the floor and see whether you've had further thoughts on this, had I, you heard that story? I read it in John Osborne. Is that right? Okay. Uh, but you were there for that. I was there for that. We're going to change tapes mm -hmm. and move to the next one. Thank you. Are the answers too long? Okay. There are n there are no right answers. Okay. All right. Or like, this is great. I hope you're enjoying this. I love it. It's a. Um, You look great. Um, was it was the did the Easter package include a statement about new federalism? Was, was I'm trying I'm trying to remember that. Uh, to be honest with you, again I didn't have a chance to prep for this. Oh, well, it's I okay. Would like to no, well, I, actually, but my point was, to what extent was I Moynihan doubt it. I doubt it because as I I'm sorry as I look back on it, it was more what our staff was working on. So that would have included by then, I think, uh, I think Blumenthal had joined or, or Christy Youth, and they were starting to look at the Washington, D.C., 14th Street corridor thing. But the welfare reform thing was the, was the heart of it. I, I was just <coughs> interested in the extent to which Moynihan and the staff mm -hmm. were interested in new federalism and that idea. <coughs> well, I was because of the Ripon Society connection. Again, because one thing we had done as Ripon was we had sought to work with the Republican Governors Association and we were trying to get them to buy into revenue sharing, federal revenue sharing. So I was aware of the subject and was, was delighted when Burns grabbed it and ran with it a little later. Um, anyway, so we, we got the, the bill up on the Hill. Uh, then there followed uh, 
unsuccessful efforts to get it passed. Uh, even before it went up, um, Nixon wanted to brief Reagan and others on it. And he, through Ehrlichman, asked me to, uh, we're talking about summer of 69, because Nixon was very sensitive to the fact that, that uh, Ronald Reagan might not, have a, uh, you know, might not have inhibitions about running against him in 72. And so he asked through Ehrlichman if I could check on the incidence of <coughs> use by you know, working poor white families, uh, minority families, in different parts of the country, just so he had a sense of whether Reagan's constituency would be, you know, potential constituency in an intra-party battle would be able to uh, be brought to bear on this issue, because I think Nixon wanted to keep his flanks safe. Uh, but he went into it, Nixon did, I think, almost as a conviction matter, not just as a, not as a political matter. I think he felt the politics were not in his favor. And uh, anyway, we briefed Reagan, Patricelli and Dick Nathan and I went out and briefed Reagan in California uh, that summer. And you know, he took it all in, he was noncommittal in his response, and he had one of his techies talk to us later in the year. Then Nixon, on Christmas Eve, December 24th of 1969, uh, said something to me which was interesting, because there had just completed the White House Commission on Nutrition and Health, a guy named Jean Mayer, who was a professor at Tufts mm -hmm. Public Health School or something, had been chairman of the group and had prepared this report, and so it was given to me to implement, and I brought Dr. Mayer into the Oval Office on Christmas Eve, just the three of us, Nixon and he and I. And we talked about the report first, and then Nixon said to Mayer, he said, uh, you know, he said, we've got this proposal up on the Hill for family assistance. And he said, uh, you know, he said, it's going to be tough for us Republicans because he said, frankly, annually, he said the Democrats will try to roll us and raise the base and the Republicans may wind up resisting it. But he said to us, the important thing is that we will have established the principle, which I found very Disraelian, the principle of a negative yeah, income tax, of income maintenance. And then many years later, I was in San Clemente with the, with the president after he had gone in exile. And uh, he said to me, John, what do you think about that in retrospect? And I, I said, you know, that's a tough one because I said uh, there had been a, a Trenton OEO, Office of Economic Opportunity, experiment on income maintenance. And I said to him, frankly, this was, six, this was 19, gosh, 70 something. 79, 78, and I said, frankly, it showed there was a lot of recidivism, and I said, you know, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I don't know whether it would have been right. But at the time, he and I did, think. But then he backed off, and, and he basically finally walked from it, because it just wasn't, it had no political traction. Well, let's talk about his backing away from okay. it. Um, when do you think that's, that happens? Well, it, it <coughs> passed the House of Representatives twice. And uh, uh, I think that when it just couldn't get leverage in the Senate and when Wallace Bennett was sort of lukewarm about it, he was chair of Senate Finance through whose committee it would have had to come. Uh, and then you also had a, a ganging up of the, of the right and the left against the middle. You had uh, Carl Munt of South Dakota saying it's socialist. And you had, uh, you know, George McGovern or uh, Gene McCarthy saying it was niggardly, you know, it's either socialist or it's just, you know, sort of crumbs. And so, center didn't hold. You may know more than I. No. But that's that's my take on it. Um, no. From your other conversations with the more political people in the White House, I wasn't involved in lobbying for it. But you would. Uh, I'm I'm interested. I think people would be interested in, in seeing how optimistic your boss. Your was as, as time went by, or how mm -hmm. pessimistic you mm -hmm. became. How did what, what was Moynihan saying? Well, uh, when we when it first went up, of course he was euphoric. Um, Nixon called him after having had a couple of pops. We were all together, at, I think at Steve Hess's house or something. Pat and I and Steve and a couple of others, and uh, um, it was right after the announcement. And Pat had talked about it on the 
Sunday morning show. And Nixon called him to congratulate him. So that was sort of a high water mark, I think. Um, then, it, when it passed the House the first time, uh, I went down to Moynihan's office, which was in the basement of the White House, and which had a translucent ceiling with translucent panels in it, about mm -hmm. foot or 18 inch panels. And Pat, in his typical fashion, had in his credenza, you know, some refreshment. <laughs> and so we sat down, and he reaches over and he pulls out a bottle of champagne, you know, peels off the wrapping of the cork, and, goes, and it went right through the glass. And then there was a dark smudge there for a year where the cork had settled on, <laughs> on the pane of the translucent uh, <laughs> protection there. And so that was a constant reminder. And Pat would say, I went up to see Wilbur Mills today, and I, he said, I addressed him, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> As I say, the courtier. The courtier. Is wonderful, yeah. And uh, so he and we were hopeful through at least the first House passage, but it became clear that it was going to be heavy sledding after that. Do you remember working with Bryce Harlow? Of course. Yes, and Bryce, two, two recollections of Bryce, who was a wonderful man. Uh, well, three. One, on December 5th, 1969, when I was appointed Moynihan's successor as executive secretary of the council and special assistant. Uh, Moynihan and Bryce were appointed counselors to the president. They stood next to each other, you know, six foot three and five foot six or whatever, both having been born in Oklahoma. I don't know if you realize that. But they noted that for each other and for the benefit of the White House press corps. But I remembered Bryce, as we all first came in the White House, giving us very, very avuncular and very sound advice. We were all kids. I mean, you know, here's Ziegler at 27 and Chapin at 29 and Price at 30 and youngsters. And uh, Bryce came in and talked to this assemblage of White House staffers. And he said, uh, you know, you, you may not fully realize the, the blessing and the special character of where you now work. But he said, other people are for many reasons, everything from, you know, penetration for, you know, espionage reasons, reasons to personal gain or deal reasons. They'll be trying to cultivate you and to, you know, get to you. And so he said, just be prudent and careful. It was very, I mean, more detail than that, but some practical things to do. Uh, so that was one thing. The other recollection of Bryce as head of government relations for the president with the great shingle of having done the same thing for President Eisenhower and very widely known and respected in Washington was a revealing episode. Uh, it was a cabinet meeting and I was sitting on the wall and Bryce Harlow was sitting next to me. And at the end of the meeting, Nixon turned to walk back into his office and he said, with, with sort of a you know, cheerful, playful look on his face, he said, well, he said, today, uh, I'm in a good mood because he said, tomorrow morning is the last one of my breakfasts with members of the House. He said, I've invited, as you know, in series, all the members of the House. So he said, but tomorrow's going to be special. He said, because tomorrow Bella's coming, mm -hmm. meaning Bella Epps, yeah. who Bryce Harlow, assistant to the president for congressional relations, leans over and nudges me and he says, who's Bella? Who's Bella? Of the hat? Yeah. of the wild-eyed left-wing, you know, West Side Manhattan politics. I was absolutely stunned. Wow. Anyway. Uh, what happened in the Senate? I really can't tell you more than uh, what I said. The Senate yeah. didn't hold against the extremes, and Bennett was cool. He was the key player, I think, for the first bottleneck. Uh, what role, if any, did Donald Rumsfeld play in? On the welfare? Yes. I don't believe he was a member of that cabinet committee. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember him piping up, uh, you know, an awful lot in the full debates. He may have talked to Nixon privately. To what extent did, did uh, Moynihan and, and you and the staff uh, look at the Model Cities program and try to give some mm -hmm. advice on what to do could, about that? Could, just a last couple of thoughts oh, on welfare, sure. if I might. Oh, go ahead. If I could, Tim. Um, because not only after the president publicly proposed it, but earlier, there had been points where the plane might have gotten into a stall, you know. And so one of those was uh, late spring, very early summer. And I got worried. And so I, I said to Moynihan, I called, I think I called Finch or certainly Veneman, and I said, I'm worried that we're, we're losing some momentum. Uh, 
and uh, we need to do something. And so we organized a trip, and Moynihan and I went up to see um, an interesting trifecta. Uh, David Rockefeller, whom everybody would go to see on everything probably, as a member of the establishment. But then the other two were Terence Cardinal Cook oh. at the Archdiocese in New York, who was a man out of the social services world and a lovely, quiet man. Um, parenthetically, of whom, after we came out, Moynihan asked my opinion. And I said, well, he seems like a, a very nice man. He seems like almost just a teacher. And, but he's quiet and he's sort of, you know, low-key. And Moynihan said, yes, he said, after Cardinal Spellman, he said, few acorns grew in the shade of that mighty oak. <laughs> no. The third of the trifecta was Bill Buckley, whom Moynihan had never met. And Buckley had invited us to dinner at his home. And we had a, a dinner with Buckley and some of his acolytes. But Pat was trying, I, uh, Pat and I were trying to get a multi-pronged movement mounted on, on the president and on the, the administration to resolve the debate. One other thing was in the middle of it all. Uh, Sorry, just be clear, uh, yeah, resolve sure. the debate. About, about whether, to, whether and in what way to go forward with the welfare reform. This, this is, I say, pre-August Pre-August. This is yes. pre-August. That's why I said it was going back to the, yeah. the period when there was a lull even before the speech. A um, couple of other things, just uh, there were two incidents where we had council meetings, one of which was uh, when the National Alliance of Businessmen had a meeting. Don Kendall, again, a long-standing figure around uh, American business, and then the CEO of PepsiCo, was apparently a reasonably close friend of the president's, and he was coming in to speak for the National Alliance of Business. And so I called up his people, and I said, I'd like to, to fill you in because the president is debating about welfare reform. So I went over to his hotel suite the night before the council meeting, and we sat on the floor together drinking Pepsi-Colas, and I spread out the decision paper and walked him through the stuff just so he would be prepared to answer any questions should Nixon ask them. And uh, another one was, uh, I can't remember, Burns and somebody else, and Nixon was just watching the debate back and forth like a tennis Spectator, you know, it was fascinating. Just he was avid. You know, he loved the he loved the conflict and the uh, the argumentation between the sides. He was reveling in it. Um, the back. So you 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 uh, associate the backing away with the change in the politics on the Hill, uh, or do you see that? Do you link that to the '72 campaign? I think it's partly the latter. Sure. Yeah, because I, I think that, as I said earlier, he was worried even in 69 about what Reagan and the right might make of this issue. Because Nixon never saw any political advantage to him in it. It started out being a substantive, yeah, I think we need to do that. But I don't think he ever was convinced that politics was going to work greatly in his favor. And so I think as we got further away from the, the excitement of uh, the, the intellectual uh, victory, if you will, and the and the initial praise of folks who weren't often in his camp, then, uh, then I think he became more true to form and more political. I will say, again, after the announcement in August, Moynihan and I went over to see the National Civil Rights Leadership Coalition. And this included everybody from the American Society of Friends to the American Jewish Congress to you name it. And uh, they were just pounding on, on us and on the proposal. And Moynihan finally said, he said, you know, uh, <clears throat> just because this is Richard Nixon uh, doesn't mean that you should be pounding on this. He said, this is a progressive proposal. And Hyman Bookbinder finally spoke my mind. And he said to the group, he said, don't let the best be the enemy of the good. So that, but it's fascinating. You know, the I know there was a debate over what the minimum level should be. It was 1,600 to yes. begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, and the Nixon or the administration said, yeah. what, 2,400 or so. Mm -hmm. Some people were asking for f over 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see a lot of centrism in American right. policy making. Uh, uh, people were talking about the center then. But, but people yet, were. It, well, the, 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 why didn't the center hold? Well, Again, it was so, for, for the conservatives, this was a bridge too far, I think. And as I said earlier, um, you know, McCarthy uh, 
McCarthy, to whom I later spoke about it years later in London, uh, just felt it was insufficient and wrong, and they weren't willing to give the political credit to Nixon either. But he didn't say that to you, did he? No. Were you um, uh, on, the, on the wall watching these debates? Um, well, were you I, brought yes, yes, at that time until I became Pat's successor when I was at the table um, in but December 5th of So 69. this must have been great political it theater. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Tell us some of the other priorities. Uh, I mean, you were, yeah. your sta the staff was working on other things, too. Yes, and um, there was a very small staff. I mean, there were only about seven or eight of us. And uh, uh, you later had guys like Checker Finn start up on educational issues. <coughs> uh, as I said, you had Blumenthal working on District of Columbia issues. And then Kristen Muth and others started working on the Model Cities program. But Dick Nathan was deeply involved in that and very knowledgeable about model cities. And um, I think we were trying to square the circle because maybe he and, and some of us felt that there were some important elements to the model cities program that Nixon ought to continue or think of continuing. The, as I stepped back from it and talking to academics later about the model cities program, uh, it was sort of a Nixonian response by Lyndon Johnson to the excesses of the poverty program. Because in the poverty program, what had happened was that the federal government gave money to antis and to critics and to advocates outside of the structure of units of local government. So what the Model Cities program did in Johnson's mind was he, he sort of began to ignore OEO and began to move the funding back through City Hall. And so it was a more normalizing kind of a program than had been the poverty program. So for that reason, some of us thought Nixon might be appealed to by it. But I think it probably the reaction of a lot of folks, and they weren't always so forthcoming as to say this to me, within the White House staff, um, would have been, it's a Johnson legacy program. Why do we want to you know, do anything except either ignore it or deep six it? Um, community action. That was interesting because, again, Rummy uh, brought in one of his old college buddies, uh, Frank Carlucci, to be the senior line guy at the OEO. He ran the community action agencies and tried to tone them down, you know, as I say, tried to, to manage through the excesses. Um, <clears throat> Cheney, I, uh, that's when I first got to know him, but I didn't see him uh, you know, central in the discussions. But then that's not his way, I guess, uh, <laughs> as, we, as we see. Um, he's more oblique or more behind the uh, closed doors. Uh, but Carlucci worked very hard at it. And uh, I remember, and you may have come across this, uh, just thinking about it now, for the first time in years, there was a, a meeting convened at Blair House by Ehrlichman after I wound up basically uh, uh, falling more in the Ehrlichman ambit. And we, I, had, I pulled together a paper on trying to get HUD and, and the poverty program more on the same page in terms of what they could do in support of these efforts. And Carlucci said to me, you're a brave guy. <laughs> um, but I, I can't remember, to be honest with you, the, uh, the, the outcome or the substance of that discussion. Why, why, why did he think you were particularly courageous? Well, because I, w I just was saying, you know, here's what's going on and here's what we might do about it and putting on paper options which might take things away from here or, or from here and do things differently. So, uh, Tell us a bit about falling uh, under Arlickman's control. Yes. Uh, what happened when in December of 69 I took over from Pat. <coughs> Pat was uh, basically without portfolio at that point. And Ehrlichman was, because of his increasing role in, in that area of domestic policy, uh, you know, really shepherding it. And so uh, while Pat was still there and I was still doing most of my work with Pat, nonetheless, Ehrlichman was, was very much in the wings and I would start having breakfast with him and Todd Hullen every morning, his three soft boiled eggs at seven o'clock in the morning. And, um, but Pat continued, and I did, through uh, 70, early 70, to work on National Urban Growth Policy. And Ehrlichman was perfectly pleased, at least seemed to so, to let us continue with that. And that played out through 
a series of different uh, meetings and papers that uh, I put together or worked on. Did you work on the black capitalism issue? No, not uh, directly. That was more Maury Stan's initiative at the Commerce Department itself, where EDA was the, the Economic Development Administration was the relevant agency. Were you working with HUD on, the, uh, on subsidizing um, low-income housing? Did you do any it of that? Was, it was more the Model Cities program and urban growth policy and new towns is where I spent more time. Henry Cashin, again, had come in and was beginning to build the portfolio of more of the HUD programs. So I wasn't doing multifamily stuff and I wasn't overseeing FHA. You know, that began to be Henry. Were you thinking... It was more, it was more as, as you look back on it, more sort of new policy initiatives, longer range, somewhat more strategic planning. Um, Len Garment had sort of gotten started something called the National Goals Research Staff. I don't know if you ever uh. came across that. <coughs> Which were futurists, you know, and he, uh, he hired a couple of guys that uh, worked on that. Can't remember their names, but they did a lot of speculation about demographic trends and things of that character. So it was more over the horizon, as I say. And Moynihan was also very interested in uh, trying to call the various pots of social policy research that had been funded by an HEW or a labor department or HUD or OEO, and um, just try and bring them to bear on, on policy. Um, you describe uh, the FAP as, as actually ultimately an amalgam of different strains of ideas, uh, with Moynihan's being one of those strains. Yeah. Did you see well, an evolution? No, I think, I think you'd have to say not that they were an amalgam or a potpourri, but rather that one, more or less, one over the others. That is the idea of a negative, negative income tax. One over, one over the family allowance, allowance, you know, which would have been a, a hundred billion dollar program. Uh, or over pure national standards um, with with the working poor element and also with a work requirement which Nixon insisted be put and that and that really came from the Arthur Burns side the and Nixon and, and Nixon. Nixon absolutely it was the president himself and you do you rem remember him talking about that when he was chairing these meetings or yes yeah um, did you see an evolution uh, in Moynihan's thinking about some of these issues in the time that you you know the, the period you worked with him well, I think that more than an evolution of his thinking was his sense of his changing and gradually diminishing role. I think that at times he was very frustrated. I think he was very, I think he was very loyal to the president. He loved to talk to the press, but I think he was very, I think he, he liked the president personally. There's a picture I'd love to show you, which I have of the two of them. It's a black and white photo in the Oval Office. And the two of them are, are standing together in suit and tie, and uh, Moynihan has this sort of puckish, impish look on his face. You know. And the president, he said something, obviously, and the president has his shoulders and his head thrown back, just braying with laughter. And there was a mutual, uh, almost an affection between the two of them. But I think that uh, Pat was a little too outré uh, for you know most of the folks who've been long-time Nixon loyalists and who worried about the politics of his still being there. And, um, uh, you know, just he was different. Was it a steady erosion, or would you see, the, see it as, as... Linked as, to something? Yeah, are there... Yes. I, I can't give you an answer to that. The high point, would you say the high point was in August 69? Yeah, in many ways, that's right. For him. Um, yeah. Does the benign neglect memo factor in some of that's this? could be. I'd, I'd forgotten it. Uh, that was the memo, for those of you in the audience, who, <laughs> which was written by a governor general of Canada in the 19th century, suggesting a posture uh, that the British government should take of benign neglect. And Moynihan suggested this about the ruckus regarding race relations. Um, you know, people forget, you're too young probably even yourself, Tim, but when the inauguration occurred in 1969, it was following a year of major urban disturbances, going back as far as the Watts riots in 67, major, major urban and often racially connected disturbances in cities like Omaha, Detroit, uh, you name them. And if I correctly remember, when the inauguration was held, there were water-cooled machine guns on the uh, steps of the Capitol building. It was, it was very tough. And um, 
one of the things that we faced early on and that Moynihan reported to Nixon on was that um, the degree, the level of suspicion of Nixon in the black community was appallingly high. And Moynihan reported to him that the, the clear conviction of many, many African Americans was that there would be no more elections for president, that elections were going to be suspended. So this kind of air of, of uh, complete distrust. And so Moynihan uh, came in, was, was very concerned about it. Uh, things may have cooled down a little bit by the end of, of 69, but yeah, I had the benign neglect thing um, foots into that, that he, he just didn't want to fan the flames a lot more of, of all these excessive uh, thoughts that were out there. Uh, did, uh, did he ever wonder about who leaked it? Of course he wondered. He never asked me what I thought or I, I think he assumed that people in the Haldeman staff but I'm not sure uh, to hurt him to yeah mm -hmm. to yes to to damage him in Nixon's eyes you know because of his being uh, you know harmed by that he was always very sensitive about criticism from the black community uh, starting with the famous Moynihan report in 65 I think it was for Johnson when as he told me, in his description of the demographics of the, the African American community and the impact, the terrible impact on them of, of slavery over the decades, um, he, he just said that uh, when the report was published, I guess he gave it in a speech at American University, that Roy Wilkins and others called him privately on the phone to say he was absolutely right, spot on, and they would go out and condemn him in a press conference. And so he was, it was very hard for him. Moynihan, when he, the day he made the offer to me on my 30th birthday, told me something lovely. First of all, he bought a glass of, a bottle of wine for us when he learned it for my birthday. But then he went on to, to say um, that the American form of slavery was the most savage that the world had ever seen because of the breaking up of families and all these things. And he talk, compared it with Brazil and Greece and so on. But then he said something that's just beautiful. Um, he said that America has it, in a very Irish way he said it, America has it within its gift to become the first truly multiracial society in history. Hmm. We, let's go to the next tape. Okay. Uh, and I have a few more questions. They're beautiful. There's some wonderful memories, you know, just interesting memories. Yes. He was fascinating. He was fun. He <laughs> sounds know. great. He was incredible. But you were you there. Mr. Price, let's talk about uh, your work shepherding the health insurance bill. Thank you. Um, once I sort of went from one trapeze to the other to Ehrlichman, um, I put up my hand and I said, you know, as I felt welfare reform was important and timely, I'd love to work on whatever you're going to do in the health care area. And he said, okay. And so I began on two fronts. One was there was a lot of commotion at that time around, the acronym was HICFA, I don't even remember what it, what it was, but over at HEW there was an area which uh, ultimately became the sort of managed care support area, like HMOs. Mm -hmm. And so my first bite at the apple was working with them and I guess BOB on, on uh, managed care, on ways in which we might support that because at that time, as periodically occurs, there was real concern about the pace of growth in health, health insurance and health care expenses. And so I began to work on that, and we finally pulled a paper together, uh, HEW and myself and POB, and gave it to Nixon about certain forms of support for, uh, for managed care. Uh, 
and Spiro again got into the act, and Ken Cole called me to say that uh, he'd given the vice president a copy of my paper while the vice president was going out to Las Vegas for a uh, golf game or something. And he called the president from the plane, reading the paper and saying, my God, you're listening to this guy Price? He said, this is crazy. And uh, Ken Cole said, not to worry. The president said, relax. <clears throat> but uh, so he was, he was on to it, too. But on the other front, which is the health insurance area, there we, we uh, had a lot more running room and a lot more interest. And I'm sure that Paul can tell you more about it, because he uh, certainly was deeply involved. Very, very yeah. well. And so all I did was I sort of tried to pull together the initial decision paper, and then they drafted the bill. Uh, but it was, it was um, fascinating, given subsequent discussions, because what Nixon proposed was universal coverage of health insurance, done, however, through the private carriers. And I can't even remember the details. I suspect you've gotten them from Paul. But uh, it, was, it was a very, very interesting and historic try by Nixon. But again, what happened? Couldn't get it passed. Um, you've mentioned the vice president a couple of times. Um, he was viewed as a, as a Rockefeller Republican. Not by then. No, I mean, he had yeah, what become, happened? he'd become the point of the spear for Nixon's politics, really. Plus, I think he, he was trying to carve out his own role and maybe his own base within the party, either to challenge Nixon or to seek the presidency himself later on. As I say, he was totally disillusioned with Rockefeller's uh, spurning of him earlier. But then I think he just saw the way the, the, the tide was moving. And, uh, and it stylistically, it fit him. You know, he, was, he, he loved word weaseling, and he was a very impeccable dresser, and he was you know, natty and, and um, always hard for a vice president, except for this one, poor Dick Cheney. So I, I don't know what combination of things drove him that let direction. Ask, let me ask you about the shadow of Vietnam. You were in, a, you were in the White House in a, in a particularly difficult period. You're there yes. when Kent State happens. Yes. Uh, you're there <coughs> when the demonstrations are, uh, seem so threatening that buses are placed around That's the White right. House. <coughs> um, to, to what extent is that influencing the way you think about domestic policy? The, the unhappiness over the war? Well, y one thing was the uh, rhetoric about a so-called peace and growth dividend, meaning as the war would wind down, those resources would become available for domestic needs and policy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so there was a certain air of unreality about those expectations. Moynihan made a wonderful comment at a press conference in San Clemente in August of 69. He came out in front of the press corps and he said, the peace and growth dividend will be as evanescent as the morning clouds over San Clemente. And so that, that's one way in which the war yeah. was in our sight line. Um, <clears throat> didn't directly touch me. I mean, I wasn't NSC staff. I, I was involved when they had the uh, mobilization thing and they ringed the White House uh, with buses. I, I did get a visitation from my college president and a bunch of students. And I did arrange for them to meet with Pat and also with the Secretary of State in an attempt to sort of defuse some of the emotions, as many, many White House staffers did. And they were really, Ehrlichman's book tells you about how, how many of us were <coughs> involved in trying to, to dissipate some of the tension and fear there. Ehrlichman's own daughter was on the phone calling him from pay phone boxes in the West Coast saying, God, can't you, can't you get this man to do something about the war? <clears throat> at least that was what I heard. I was wondering whether Cambodia affected the st yes. affected staff morale at all. Uh, yeah, definitely. May 1970, May 5th maybe. And I went on the airwaves that night uh, with a guy from Young Americans for Freedom and others and talked about the Cambodian incursion. And um, it was very, very, very discouraging, you know. And uh, I think we then realized that that it was going to be a drawn-out process. And it was what five years later that we finally got out of Vietnam. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, no, but I'm. Not, I right. wanted to know what. Yeah, and we all we all were um, struck by his 
uh, effort to go out and at night, in the middle of the night, go out to the Lincoln Memorial and walk among uh, protesters and so on. <clears throat> and again, the, the wonderful poor man, you know, he, uh, so one reads, was awkward and unable to, to really engage in conversation, but was, God knows, talking about football or something. I mean, he, he was trying to reach out because he, at his heart, I think he felt he, he had it to and wanted to, but he couldn't do it effectively. What can you tell us about why Moynihan left? the White House? Well, A, he had a tenure uh, time up at Harvard coming fairly soon. And I think, as I said, his role had been diminished, and uh, John had, had really uh, assumed the authority over and ran in a, in a more structured way than Pat may have done uh, domestic policy formation. And I think Nixon, by that time, uh, saw less utility to meetings and more in decision-making you know, on a, on a more confined basis. What about your own decision to leave? Why did you leave the White House? I wanted to go back and run for Congress, and I did try, unsuccessfully, to get the nomination. Uh, but that, I, I, you know, I told you when I was in grad school that I stayed less time than I might have because I, I felt I'd get too embedded or too relaxed. And I, I had other dreams, other things I wanted to do. So I went back. Uh, Actually, my last year also, I worked a lot on urban development and uh, urban growth and the financing of urban development. And I, I reached a conclusion which drove my career decision because I, looking at all these model cities projects or demonstration projects or pilot projects, I said, that's all great, but they're just going to be froth on the surface unless you get institutional capital to buy into whatever the the policy desire is, and therefore you need pension funds, you need insurance companies, you need Wall Street. So I said, I better go back to boot camp, and that's what I did. I went to an investment bank and, and tried to run for Congress at the same time. And I've been in banking since. Uh, you mentioned you felt that um, Richard Nixon was the last moderate Republican president. Mm -hmm. What happened to the moderate wing of the Republican Party? It was. Uh, yeah. It, it was making policy, at least in 1969. Yes, it was. Yeah, and Nixon, uh, again, how do I know? Because I'm an outsider. But unlike, let's say, this administration, uh, Nixon was inclusive. I mean, he brought me in. I was, at the time he hired me, chairman of the Ripon Society. And he brought in Tom Houston, who later you know, hatched the, the plans that the attorney general uh, seemed to bless about extreme activities. And, so you have, and Marty Anderson. Uh, so Nixon, uh, Nixon was a moderate in the sense maybe of style, of uh, the analytical mm -hmm. style, not so much an ideological style. I, I think of another example, which was on this whole area of urban development and so on that I was so interested in. One of the issues that came in front of all of us was an issue of whether there should be a federal taking, a federal eminent domain power. Uh, for purposes of realizing the value creation you, you make in zoning decisions mm -hmm. on behalf of a city or urban, spa urban design spaces. And so there was a hell of a tussle uh, around the Ehrlichman morning staff meeting table around whether that was right. And Marty Anderson was adamant, saying that kind of option should never even be seen by the president. And the, and the rest of us and Ehrlichman said, options papers are options papers. Let the president decide. But it's not our job to keep something from him. So in that sense, I think Nixon was uh, moderate. Um, uh, Hugh Scott one time talking up at law school, Senator Scott, the minority mm -hmm. leader in the Senate, said of Nixon, he said, <clears throat> Richard Nixon is the guy with the portable middle. And I said, I know what you mean, like the bubble in the plumber's level. You know? mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it was tacking, but th therefore he wasn't being an ideologue. He wasn't coming at it from a hard right position. In fact, as I'm told by guys like John Whitaker and others who knew him much better, uh, that Nixon bore with him the scars of the 1962 gubernatorial election when it was a Joseph Schell ran against him, a Republican conservative, and just beat up like heck on him from the right. And uh, John Whitaker suggests that that left a, you know, residue with Nixon of, of 
you know, not great affection for the hard right. Um, what was is uh, this of any? No, this is a very very interesting because yeah. you, again, there is a debate among historians <coughs> about sort mm -hmm. of the the role, or the role of pragmatism mm -hmm. in that early period. Yes. Sir. Um, what what would you say was the uh, who after Moynihan leaves? Who is providing some of the intellectual candle power? John Ehrlichman. Very smart man. John Ehrlichman, the guy who really is responsible, I'm sure, for EPA being there mm -hmm. and for Nixon's conversion in part to uh, being something of an environmentalist. I mean, the first Earth Day and the first government department devoted to environmental concerns was Richard Nixon, uh, as well as uh, other things. But John, John was receptive to ideas, you know, like, like his boss. Very political. Great sense of humor, which most people don't realize. Uh, Ehrlichman had a wonderful sense of humor. From your uh, vantage point, what role did John Mitchell play in shaping any of these um, policies? Mitchell was, I'm sure, very much involved. I mean, ask Lynn Garment yes. about that. On, uh, he'd know far better than I, because Mitchell, Mitchell and I didn't have much interaction. Um, he, uh, when we were right before the inauguration, the Moynihan staff was all over at the, the uh, office of the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, of which Pat was vice chairman. And Mitchell strolled through and, and saw us there, and, and knowing I was a rip-on society guy, and knowing me, he said, so what's my favorite juvenile delinquent doing? Which was a play off of a public you know, statement, he, a phrase he used, uh, juvenile delinquents mm. about all the, the left-wingers. But um, he, an example, when we created the Urban Affairs Council, we created a series of standing committees, cabinet level committees, one of which was crime. And John called Pat and said, no, no committee. That's me. Uh, which is as good an anecdote as I could give you uh, to tell you about his power. Are there any other stories you'd like to about preserve? John? Not about John, just from your time and that we haven't uh, accessed mm -hmm. through this discussion about Moynihan or mm -hmm. about the climate of the times. Um, well, Pat was Pat was wonderful, um, colorful. We we uh, on Saturdays would often be over at his office and. I remember one time, this was around the time of all the community action agencies and the Black Panthers, and, and uh, there had been a lot of people saying they were going to liberate this or liberate that. And so uh, Moynihan again reached behind his credenza and pulls out a bottle of Black Label and a couple of glasses, and he said, let's go over to the White House mess and liberate some ice. <laughs> and then <laughs> go up on the, as we did, it was Saturday, the president was away, so we sat on the porch overlooking the Rose Garden and had drinks for an hour and talked. And that was just the way it was. And he, um, he, for Christmas the first year, gave all of the men on his staff beautiful silver cufflinks with our initials on the outside and his on the interior part. And uh, he, was, he was warm. He threw my bachelor party for me and uh, uh, when I got married to a woman on the Ash Council staff. And uh, he was fun. He was also demanding, and he was also very Irish, and and had this uh, temper which was like a towering cumulus, you know, summer <laughs> thunderstorm cloud, which could dissipate. For example, on the paper on welfare reform, which I alluded to, um, I did a draft of this decision paper for him, the options paper, <clears throat> and he called me in his office one evening around six, and he threw his throat down on the, the table in front of me. He says, Price, your prose is opaque. He said, rewrite it. And I spent all night, I dropped the, the paper on his desk the next morning at 7, and it was the one that went in the Easter package. But, you know, as I say, he could be very, very forceful and very uh, tough, but very loving, too. It was great fun. Did at you that time, I mean, I, I didn't know him later uh, when he may have been more cranky and, and certainly physically suffering. Uh, well, he had a... Yeah, the, the black label became a problem. Yes, I know. Um, did you ever see him interact with Kissinger? Not a lot. Kissinger Moynihan, though, let me tell you one more little story. It was a Saturday again. And I was with Pat downstairs in his office, and uh, 
we happened to walk out of his office, which door was right at the foot of the steps coming from the level above in the White House on which the Oval Office is and the Cabinet Room. And we literally physically bumped into the President. And the first thing Moynihan did, his first reaction is, oh, good morning, Mr. President. He gets his hand behind my backside and he pushes me in front of the President and said, Mr. President, said, you remember John Price who's doing your work on welfare reform. And you think of Henry Kissinger and the impression one has of his sucking dry of information, any of his staff, locking them in the closet and then going in and briefing the President. But just that, that instinctive human difference between a Moynihan and a Kissinger I found interesting. Mr. Price, thank you for your time. You're more than welcome. This is great. Thanks. Well, I hope it gives you a little color. It uh, gives me a lot of color. Good. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. It's um, and that was that was great. We have uh, about ninety minutes. Ninety minutes. Say, but mean to say, it's the early day.